This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad, rejoice in it. With those words, we come together with worship this morning, and I'm glad you can be part of the congregation. But I don't know about you. Some days I find it hard to rejoice, to be glad. Those days when worries take over. Our gospel reading this morning has Jesus speaking to the crowd, telling them, you don't have anything to worry about. Yet at the same time, he talks about being ready, being prepared. Is that a paradox? Not to worry, getting ready, being prepared. In his sermon this morning, Pastor Rob speaks to us of our tendency to be anxious, of not being trusting in the Lord. We bring who we are. We bring our concerns. We bring our hopes and our anxieties before God this day, and we lay them before him as we hear the good news that in Jesus Christ, nothing can separate us from God's love. Blessings be upon you as we join together in worship this day. we go. Oh, great. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Rob, and welcome to worship this day. If you're calling in, again, I invite you to turn on anything in the background. If you're worshiping online with us, welcome. Uh, and yeah, if there's children who are among us, we have busy bags, and there's a parade ground in, in our, uh, right outside of the sanctuary. But I think at this point, I invite us just wherever we've been this last week to take a breath and know that the Holy Spirit has gathered us into one this morning to worship and to praise. Please rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin Receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin 
and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. By grace you have been saved. Out of great love, God sent the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And as Jesus Christ lives victorious from the grave, I declare to you that in his name your sins are forgiven. Amen and alleluia. Together we join in singing hymn number 771, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you. 
Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may be ready to receive you wherever you appear. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Hebrews, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation. Even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered himself, he, he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 33 responsibly as printed in your bulletin. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The, the Lord, Lord looks, looks down, down from, from heaven. heaven. He, he sees, sees all humankind. humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love to, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Please rise.
Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. I'm going to read just right before the section that is printed in your bulletins. I think the topics are the same, but Jesus' words here are more clear. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouses nor barns, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to the span of life? If you are not able to do a small thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat or what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. Instead, seek the kingdom of God, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'd like you to be seated, and I believe we have a children's message today. Dave, would you like coming up with me? All right. Come on up, come on over. Good morning, church. Good morning, Jace. Good morning, any kids that are with us online today. Today's children's sermon is a story that I would like to share with you. And it's the story of someone very important in the Bible. His name is Abraham. And we heard a little about his story just read, but it's the story that's paired today with the gospel. So let's open it up. Do you want to be the one to open it, Jane? Okay, here we go. Ready? It starts like this. A long, long time ago, God asked a man named Abram to leave the beautiful city of Ur where he lived. God loved Abram, and he wanted Abram and his family to have a special place. God promised to show Abram the way to a new land. So Abram and his family packed up their things, and they got ready to move. Abram's journey took him hundreds and hundreds of miles across a hot desert. Abram and his family and his servants and his animals walked and walked and walked and walked. One night they stopped and camped on a mountain. And while they were on the mountain, Abram built an altar and worshipped God. Abram trusted God to take care of him. And sure enough, God gave Abram just what he needed. And God promised Abram that his family would grow and grow. Abram wouldn't be able to count all the people in his family, just as he couldn't count all the stars in the night sky. Then God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means the father of many. And one day, three special visitors came to see Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They were messengers from God, and they told Abraham that Sarah would soon have a baby. And that's just what happened. Sarah and Abraham had a little baby boy. They named him Isaac, which means laughter, because they were so thankful and happy that God kept God's promise. Do you? And that's what we're hearing about in church today. The promise that God made is one he will never break. And sometimes, just like Abraham, we worry and we wonder. But God always reminds us that his promises are true. And a way to remember the promise of God is with the star. Because God promised Abraham would have descendants even more than the stars in the sky. So, Jace, for you today, I have a star as a reminder that God keeps his promises to you, too. And you can pick if you would like a red, white, or blue star. Jace picks a red one. So let's say a prayer, and the congregation, please join in. Repeat after me. Thank you, God, for your promises. 
help me trust them and follow you. Amen. And Jace, this is the children's bulletin for today, and it also has Abraham and lots of stars on it for you to take back to your seat. Thanks for coming up with me today. Great. Do not worry. Jesus says words that resonate with us, words that I think we find comfort in. Life is full of worries. There are always worries that we have about our health, about our family, about our job, about the world. But my sense is that in, in these days, the last few years, we've, we've all lived with a really heightened sense of anxiety, like our, our base level of everybody is just a little bit higher, and it, it doesn't take much for us to end up in that state where we find ourselves having trouble sleeping, awaking, and, and finding that we just can't sort of purge ourselves from all of the worries that are accumulating on us. Jesus today, in his words about worry, he sort of brings it all together, and he says it is the, the Father. This is Jesus' name for God. It is the, the Father. It is the goodwill. It is the pleasure of God to give us the kingdom. And well, what is the kingdom? Well, one of the, I think, the beautiful definitions of the kingdom of God is what Paul, St. Paul, writes to us, and he says that God's kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I can't think of anything that is, that is sort of more anti-anxiety. Righteousness, right relationship with God and with our neighbors. Joy, that, that surprise that comes when there's reconciliation and love and laughter we weren't expecting. And finally, peace. Not just that there's not conflict, but that, that profound sense that it is well with my soul and that it will be okay for God is here and God is sovereign. Again, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that's the kingdom of God. And that really is the, the opposite of the anxious state that we so often find ourselves in. So, so what's going on if it is God's good pleasure to to give us this righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, but we find ourselves so often in a different m emotional, a different world. Well, that which separates us from God and God's kingdom is, is always sin, be it in the world or in our hearts in the decisions we make. And there's a particular way, I think, that is, that is manifesting itself, making itself real in our world. I want to share with you my experience because my sense is that this will, will resonate with you. Well, I was on a vacation. We were traveling very far to go to a family wedding. And the travel was quite strenuous, so we had to pack everything and make sure we got to the airport on time and make sure then when we got off that we got to the train and got to this and got to that. And, and then we had to plan for the wedding and it turned out we were going to be part of the wedding and all this kind of stuff. And what it meant is that for about a week, I didn't use my phone except to find out when the trains were coming, right? I, I, I totally shut off social media and the news. But then after a week, I was kind of curious what was happening in the big, bold world, and so I, I loaded up one of the news pages. And I actually, uh, when I read it, I, I actually had a gag reflex. It, it was as if my body was ingesting a toxin and it was rejecting it. And, and, and almost as if like I have normally a built-up tolerance to the toxicity of, of the media in this country, and then I, I sort of weaned myself off of it for a week, and then I tried to ingest it again, and it was literally like a poison was entering my body. I began on my vacation to realize how much my anxiety is produced by the way in which I consume both media and social media. And I, I've, I've spoken about this before, but, but to kind of summarize, whether you're young and sort of looking at Snapchat and TikTok, or, or whether you're older and reading blogs and, and watching cable news, how, however you get your sort of consume your media, 
fundamentally there are like five channels, right? There's, there's channel anger, where we learn all the things that other people are doing that we should be mad about. There's channel fear, all the problems that are going to happen. There's, then there's channel envy about how everybody else's life and marriage and house looks beautiful and good and how we should no longer be content with what we have. And then, well, then there's channel gluttony and channel lust to help us think we can buy our way out of all the other problems in the world. Can I get an amen? Amen, right? So, so we know these are the sort of the channels. And the irony, of course, is that we willingly allow ourselves to consume this for hours a day and then we wonder why we don't feel good. But I want to um, think a little bit more about this and, and say that I, I actually think that, that the anxieties that we bear and, and this hunger for righteousness and, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit is something that is profound, and I believe it is our, our calling as a, as a church, as a community, to help teach each other how we can receive this gift of God. For the past few years, we've been on a, a journey at this church of talking about how we can pray. In some ways, pray more contemplatively and really invite ourselves into God's presence. Ultimately, this will lead, again, this, hopefully this fall, to the construction of the prayer labyrinth outside. We've also been trying as a church to, to find ways to bridge people, to, to allow people to work together rather than sort of just sort of live in anxious anger to, to find constructive ways that we can make a difference in this world. Right? We can't deal, we can't fix, or we can't change our nation's 20-year interaction in Afghanistan, but we've been able this last year, and it's, it's had its challenges and its joys, to work with the refugee family. We, we can't change the sort of the, the curve on the climate, but we've been planting trees. We can't deal with the complexity of the inflation and food costs, but we're, we're growing food and we're, we're giving it away. Again, we've been trying to sort of be the anti-anxiety. Anti we've been trying to be a place where the righteousness, peace, and joy that God intends for us is, is abundant and accessible. But I want to push a little bit harder here. I want to go a little bit deeper with you. Because I think what's, what's happening with our media is not just that it is producing anxiety, but it is actually separating us from the cure. I believe that the media and social media we are consuming is not only causing us anxiety, but it is separating us from the cure, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. And what is happening is, is that the, the media is making a shift here. And see, the media is not talking to us about Christ as a noun. The media talks about Christ as an adjective that is Christian. And that difference from Christ to Christian is, is a world away. Because when, when you talk about something that's Christian, you actually don't have to deal with Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ, he's not so easily manipulated. And in fact, he's challenging and he does the unexpected. He, he feeds the hungry. He eats with sinners. He heals the blind. He casts out demons. He challenges the authorities. He is killed by an oppressive police state. And then he mysteriously rises from the dead and equips the uneducated to share the good news. This cannot be manipulated. This challenges and, and, and forces us to confront in fact, the presence of Jesus will bring about the peace and righteousness and joy. But when we move to Christian as an adjective, this is where the media and politicians have a field day. You see, because once Jesus becomes an adjective, then we can label things as Christian, be it a policy, a state, a nation, a family, a value and never have to deal with the messiness of who Jesus actually is. And then this allows politicians to do one of two things. It allows them to either play the fear and anger card that something Christian is going to be taken away from us, 
or it allows them to portray the Christian voters as the bad people who will take those things away from us. And so we have this, these cultural wars. And what's happening, instead of inviting Christ into the middle and realizing the inherent complexity and the need to work together, what happens is we, we throw the word Christian as an adjective on this, and it acts like oil on a fire, and it just explodes. You see, Christ is the Son of God who demands our loyalty above all things. Christian is a fundraising word. Christ is the one who demands our loyalty above all things, the one who died and rose for us to bring about the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Christian is a fundraising term. And what's happened is that there's a whole generation now of people who they hate that word. And so the very thing that could be the balm for them. How many of you know somebody in your life that is hungry for the peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit, but will not hear of church? How many of you know somebody that longs for the peace, righteousness, and joy, but will not hear of the church? We all know them. And this is what has happened, again, when we move from Christ to Christian. Because this is the marionette that the politicians and media can play. This is the Son of God who stands alone on the cross, crucified and risen for you. Now you might say, Pastor, why in a sermon, when you're supposed to be helping me become less anxious, <laughs> are you talking about this? In part because I think we need to realize what we're up against. We need to recognize that the way in which we consume this media and social media, when we give ourselves over to channel anger and fear and jealousy and gluttony and lust, when we give ourselves over to that, we are not seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And this is really the challenge and the call for us right now. How can I orient and how can I be fed by Christ and his words? But moreover, because I want to acknowledge, the world we live in is complex and interconnected, and it is broken. And so there's, there's no way we can totally remove ourselves from, from all of the problems of the world. Somehow we're going to have to find, somehow we're going to have to receive the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit in the midst of a broken and fallen world that will always have reasons to make us anxious. Our task then is over and against that noise, over and against the gods of anger and fear and jealousy that want and to seduce us to worship them, to seek first the kingdom, to hand over to Christ all our anxieties, and to, by Christ's power, have our eyes open to our neighbor whom we can serve. And I'll end with a, a short story here. While I was in Germany, I happened upon, it really was not intentional, the church where a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer first served as pastor. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would go on, and he would be part of the resistance in Germany to the Nazi church. He would actually be killed at the very end of the war. But uh, this was his first call as pastor, and, and it brought me a strange smile to read his, his letters about this, where he said that he had discipline problems with the confirmation students. And, and it just made me happy to know that even Dietrich Bonhoeffer had, had problems getting 12 and 13 and 14-year-olds to pay attention. That, again, that just brought a smile to my face. But, but, it, but you see, the 30s in Germany were a crazy time for the church and for the state. Everything was sort of unraveling. And what Bonhoeffer writes is that these kids were really poor and they didn't have clothing. They didn't have clothing for their confirmation day. That would be nice. And so Bonhoeffer went out and bought clothing for them and stitched them clothing for their confirmation. This isn't, of course, about looking nice for a confirmation day. It was about in the world that was broken and falling apart, Bonhoeffer saying, following Christ, seeking first the kingdom and saying, there's a million and one problems in the world. How can I help my neighbor? 
So again, we're called to seek first the kingdom of God. And that's about yeah, thinking about how we're consuming media, what we're allowing to influence ourselves and seeking above all to hear God's word in our life and turning over our cares and anxieties to Christ and then opening up our hands and our hearts and our ears, maybe even to sow as we follow Christ in serving our neighbor. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> We give thanks for God's merciful compassion as we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, we bring before you our countless anxieties and fears about our world, our loved ones, and our health. We pray that you might open our ears and hearts daily to receive the righteousness, peace, and joy you desire for us. 
Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Holy One, we pray for our fellow Christians. We lift before you the ministry of Conga Lutheran. We pray for the churches in Lidditz that we might work together for your glory. We also pray for the National Assembly of the Lutheran Church this week. Bind us together in faith, hope, and love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One, we pray for peace. Teach us to be peacemakers in our midst. We pray for peace in Ukraine, including the leaders burdened with finding a way forward. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One, we pray for healing to our restless hearts and weary bodies. Restore the aching souls and bodies of those who seek comfort. We pray for those who are struggling to make ends meet in the face of raised prices. We lift before you those in need of prayer, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Holy One, we pray for farmers. May the harvest be abundant that all may, might eat. We lift before you the ministry of the Whittle Farm, Peter's Porch, the Community Chest, and our Community Garden. Lord, in your mercy. Risen Lord, we lift to you these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. We greet one another in Christ's name. I invite us all to be seated for uh, a few announcements. Um, earlier this summer, we put out a call for more people to be involved in worship, and so many of you have stepped forward, and I, and I thank you for that. There are still plenty of uh, ways in which we can get involved, but I, I want to acknowledge and say thank you to all those that have tried uh, a new way of, uh, of volunteering or resumed a way that you had before. On the back of our green uh, bulletin insert are a number of things that are just kind of have been happening uh, this summer, uh, really good things, ways in which the ball uh, for ministry is moving forward, um, ways in which, again, your, your tithes and your offerings allow us to, uh, to continue to move ahead. One thing that I uh, wish I had included also is we have a number of, of uh, families and youth and children going to camp, and I thank you for uh, that as well, that we sponsor them. This encourages families to go. Um, also, just in terms of, of finances, if you have a Thrive and Action Team card, our youth director uh, is, has a number of ideas this fall and could use a little bit of seed money for those. Again, there's uh, lots of wonderful things going on as we sort of start to gear up, maybe tiptoe towards, towards the fall. But above all, I really want to just thank everybody for your generous support continuing to give in the summer that has allowed us to, to move ahead in so many ways in mission and in ministry. And so I invite us all to rise as we present our gifts.
pray together. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, through Christ. So the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their unending hymn. As we in the sanctuary move into the service of Holy Communion, we thank God for our chance to be together and worship this day. In his message today, Pastor Rob spoke directly to the world of anxiety. We're constantly being fed messages of gluttony, of lust, of fear, of anger. And yet Jesus invites us to a different world, to a different way of living day by day, a way of peace, of joy, of purpose and meaning that comes when we seek first the kingdom of God. Following Christ is far different than engaging in the culture worlds about what it means to be Christian. Instead, as we follow Christ, we are moved to see others from a different point of view, from the view of Christ, crucified and risen. I pray that this week, each day, as you begin the day, your message is, Lord, seek my heart, seek my mind, and remove from me anything that is not of you, that I can be a person of peace in the world this day. God bless you this day and throughout this week as you live in the peace of Christ. <laughs>